Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Living Room, where we listen, learn, and live together. I'm your host, Richard Martin. Make yourself right at home. I'm glad you're here. Today, we're going to talk about the power of exposure, the necessity of focus, and the value of editing. Now, what images and concepts came to mind when you heard those three words, exposure, focus, editing? If you thought photography and or videography, then you'd be spot on. But if you thought YouTube, Instagram, you'd also be right. If you thought hobby, business, outlet, you'd be right too. If you thought life, uh, that comprehensive term, you, you'd also be right. And if perchance you said Daniel Madden, then not only are you correct, but you'd also might be a good contestant on Jeopardy because I don't know how you would have jumped there from those three terms. But that's our guest today, my brother, my friend, we go way back. He's gonna help us dive into these three terms in the areas that I've mentioned, but also in some ways that you might not have guessed. I want you to welcome to the living room at this time, my friend, Daniel Madden. What's going on, man? Hey, man. Uh, thanks for having me, Richard, bro. Like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here, bro. Like, <laughs> How are you doing? I've been doing well. Um, glad to have you as well. It has been a little while since we've connected, and I find that our generation probably says that, you know, maybe this is an assumption, but maybe a little more than previous generations, because it's not that we don't see each other or don't yeah. see what one another is doing, you right. know, our families, travels, yeah. you know, yeah. but when you actually connect, it's like, wait, we haven't actually connected <laughs> like this in a while. So yeah, yeah I'm doing yeah. well. It's good to see you and hear you live. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, I, I totally understand, man. Like everyone's kind of like Facebook lurking or Instagram lurking. They see what each other's doing, but we never really have time to really, hey, how's it going? Like yeah. what's going on in your life? <laughs> yeah, man. Even just shooting messages back and forth on Instagram together uh, and leading up to this conversation was refreshing. Uh, mm -hmm. I have been checking you out, watching as you have developed and kind of owned a, a new creative lane and space, maybe not new in terms of practice, but maybe newer in platform. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that. And so I'm loving what I'm seeing. And so uh, one of the things that we do here in the living room is we try to listen to uh, as many different people as possible to see what we can learn from their lived experiences uh, that can help us become the best version of ourselves. Uh, mm -hmm. What about you? How are you? Um, where, where in the world are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, um, I'm up in the tundra, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, real yeah, cold yeah, up here. <laughs> yeah, I'm in, um, Edmonton, Alberta. Mm -hmm. Um, it is, uh, it's a cold area. Uh, definitely is cold. Um, however, it's a great space to raise a family. Uh, wow. we've been out here for probably about, um, going on three three years, three, three and a half years um, um, now. And um, it's been, it's been a blessing to be here. We were, before we were in Ontario area, that was cool, a little more fast paced, but we're appreciating the, the city life, but also uh, being able to step back into the suburbs area where it kind of feels country-ish. Um, they call Alberta the Texas of uh, Canada. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So that Never gives you that. a little bit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now your wife, uh, we, I knew her before I knew you. Right. Jersey, right? Yeah. Jersey. Okay. So how did you get a Jersey girl to acclimate to Canada or was that not, <laughs> did that not take too much convincing? <laughs> Honestly, it didn't really take too much convincing. Okay. Aisha is a individual that she's up for a challenge mm -hmm. and it definitely was a challenge um, for her moving from the States to Canada. Like mm -hmm. she couldn't work for a little while. I mean, well educated, all of that. And she was just sitting at home for like the first year or so mm -hmm. when she had a bachelor's and master's in education and it drove yeah. her crazy a little bit, but uh, all in all, she was excited to tackle uh, a new phase of her life. So she was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely up for it. Actually, if it wasn't for Aisha, I probably wouldn't have even applied to the job that I first got <laughs> um, pastoring 
as a children and youth pastor. Uh, she was the one that really was like, no, just go ahead, see see what happens. And yeah, God just worked it out that way. So <laughs> I don't know if you're into songwriting, but man, that sounds like a song title if it, if it wasn't for Aisha. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or a poem or something. Uh, but, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, fantastic, fantastic, man. Um, we're going to kind of start with the practical and then kind of make our way as as we vibe off of each other into maybe some more of the theoretical and philosophical and how we apply it to life. So, man, just let me know, where does your love for videography and photography come from? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll start with photography because that was my introduction into okay. any type of camera, DSLR type thing. Um it actually started with a friend of mine, mm -hmm. Michael James. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. you, you, you know Mike, right? I remember Mike. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, he had a camera that he allowed me to use just to play around with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think this was probably sophomore year at, uh, at Oakwood. So this was around 2010, 2011. Okay. And... Um, yeah, I, I was a. Um, I picked up the camera, looked through the view uh, finder, and after I took that first shot, man, that was it. <laughs> that was it. Okay, that, that was it. That was it. Like I, I immediately, I was like, oh, I really like this. I, I really like this. But from that time that I took that first shot, and the in between times when he allowed me to use his camera, um, and when I actually got my own camera, was probably a stand of five or six years okay um so i wasn't really into it i just knew i liked it but when the opportunity arose for me to get a camera of my own i jumped at it quite literally because i actually won it at my first district in a silent auction when i beat out one of my elders <laughs> in <laughs> bidding for that camera for sure uh, for sure yeah yeah, so um, it was like, uh, yeah, between that time, it was about five years that I had actually picked up a camera. Okay. But uh, as soon as I got I got it, I mean, you couldn't tell me nothing. I was out everywhere <laughs> taking pictures of rocks, flowers, people, sure. the, uh, whether they saw me or not. <laughs> <laughs> now, so, was that first camera Nikon, Sony, Canon? What was it? Yeah. It was um uh, a Canon Rebel T5i. Okay. Yeah. So um that was my the first camera that I had. Um, I mean, I still have it now. I'm planning on. I I really don't need it, mm -hmm. and I I really need to get rid of it at this point. But there's a certain uh nostalgia, or <laughs> nostalgic sure. feelings behind it. But I, I, it's it's literally just sitting in a drawer to the left of me, honestly, just collecting dust at this right. point, because uh, I don't use it anymore. But yeah, that was my first camera. And what are you using now? Um, using now is a um, Canon EOS um, uh, R. Okay, got mm -hmm. you, got you. So when did videography become a part of your toolkit? Yeah, um, videography came in a little later. Um, I would probably say within the last two years, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, last two years, um, I kind of picked that up a little bit more. And um, I always said I wanted to start a YouTube um, channel, but I just never got around to doing it. Sure. And it was interesting that a lot of people started doing a lot more things when the pandemic hit. Yep. And I literally just started that, um, like my YouTube channel, it started like the, right before everything shut down. So <laughs> it was uh, last month, last, uh, well, yeah, it, it's been around a year now since I've actually had my YouTube channel. So it was last year in March, beginning of March, when mm -hmm. um, I started the YouTube channel, or I think it was end of February, and then everything just shut down. I was like, well, at least I have this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. So sure. that's and when I, can... I... Mm -hmm. no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So yeah, that's when I picked it up. And I've also had help as well. One of my good friends, Evan um, Morsell, he um, has been a big influence within the videography area. Mm -hmm. He's like, bro, photography is, it's good. But I'm telling you, when you come over to filmmaking, it'll change your life. And For he's sure. not wrong. <laughs> For sure. 
Well, I've definitely been um, engaging a lot of your content. And I must say, man, like you have a knack for storytelling. And mm. storytelling is not easy. Um, but then when you put a camera in front of yourself or in front of others and you're trying to build a narrative or when you gather a lot of content and you're now trying to say, okay, this might not fit how I thought it would fit or man, I didn't think about this, but this actually goes here. How has that growth experience been for you as a storyteller, both as a photographer and as a videographer? Yeah, um, I think I, I, um, I was a lot more focused on making sure that everything that I outlined in my head for my videos when I first started yeah. actually came to fruition. But even now I'm realizing that in the storytelling process, that's a good storyteller knows when to leave out details mm. as well. Mm. And um, that has been hard. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and the challenge is now, um, like so many times, a lot of my, my YouTube videos now, um, I'll, I'll record a whole bunch mm -hmm. and I'll get down to the editing part. And I cut out a whole five, 10 minutes. Sure. Like it doesn't fit. So it needs to go. And then you start thinking, well, where else am I going to put this? Can I use this sometime? And it, and most times it's honestly, it just lives on a hard drive yeah. <laughs> somewhere. Um, and so that's probably one of the harder things that I've had to learn uh, as a storyteller um, is not everything has to be within that particular story. Sure. And, and I think that, um, you know, especially some of the people that I've surrounded myself around that are within that sphere, or either on YouTube or their professional um, filmmakers and whatnot, they have often told me like, maybe you overshare there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, for, and honestly, for photography, storytelling wasn't too much of an emphasis at, um, uh, at a point. It was more of a, something's beautiful, let's take the picture, wow. let's post it. Wow. Right? <laughs> um, because like, how can you tell a story with a still picture? Um, and then eventually I started to, you know, kind of just look around, whether it was on Instagram or just seeing some of my other friends, um, um, in particular, a person like uh, uh, Miguel Sarant, right? Yep. Um, and seeing how he takes pictures as well. And uh, some of the people that I've just seen right around, like you look at their pictures and you're like, oh, wow, this, this tells a story. For sure. Um, same thing with um, Michael James, right? Mm -hmm. um, I look at some of the pictures that he took in barbecues and just randomly. And I'm like, oh, wow, this really does tell a story. So that's when my mind shifted to stop pointing and shooting and actually look for a picture that tells a story that cool. you can help bring that story to life. So, yeah. Hey, man, like this thing is so deep already because this whole idea of exposure is integral to the photography videography um, practice and yeah. underexposure overexposure and you were just able to apply that really to life that just mm -hmm. because it's something that I can observe doesn't mean it's something that I need to embrace or show um, mm -hmm. as students know just because you research it or read it doesn't mean it's something that needs to be included in what you write um, right and I just, right. <laughs> it, it really does mirror life, right? How do we know what is for the public eye, for the public ear versus what is just something personal or private? I had the opportunity, as I'm sure you have, to engage with creatives in various spaces. And they'll mm -hmm. often say things like, you know, some of my best music is not on any of my albums. And, and these might be award-winning musicians, right? You know, or some of my greatest um, art pieces. Are, are not in anyone's home. They're, they're just, they're not for sale, right? And so I think you're right, knowing what needs to remain on the hard drive. Now, some things aren't for their beauty. Some stuff is just like, mm -hmm. you know, point in case <laughs> we're, we're out West a couple of years ago. And I hope she doesn't, you know, think I'm coming at her for this, but it's, it's actually a story we both laugh at. And uh, we have a Canon a T6 Rebel and Kyla was taking pictures of me um, right in like the heart of, or across the street from the heart of um, San Diego's downtown. Right. Mm -hmm. So we were on the boardwalk. You can see the skyline behind us. 
And while she's taking pictures, Daniel, man, she's saying, oh, these are good. These are great. You know, pose. I'm posing and smiling and flexing and all that. So, man, hours later, I'm going to review the pictures. And I mean, overexposed, just white. You know what I mean? You wouldn't know that I was behind all that light if you weren't there. Yeah. And she said, well, it looked good based on what I saw. And I was like, well, babe, everything was good through the eye hole. Like, <laughs> like when you're looking through that. But that's not the only time I too have, have made horrible mistakes with capturing mm -hmm. pictures, with recording video footage, yeah. you know, in this streaming space. Uh, mm -hmm. I speak to a camera weekend after weekend. Mm -hmm. And friends right. have said, you know, Pastor Martin, you're really bright. You might want to bring down your, your lighting or you can turn off the light above you. So these yeah. mistakes actually make you better. And I love that even with that, you're saying, hey, as you're going along, give yourself time to reflect and don't give yourself grace. You know, when you mm -hmm. first pick up a camera, hopefully mm -hmm. how you're handling it won't be the only way you handle it. You're going to grow exactly. into it. So you've exactly. already mentioned a number of names and shout out to Evans as well. He has uh, yeah. captured Kyla and I uh, before as well and has a, has a huge gift. And shout out to Sydney as well. Got to give a huge shout out. Um, <laughs> Along the way, though, and we're on this, uh, this idea of, of, of growth, mm -hmm. in your journey as a photographer, um, as you have engaged with clients, mm -hmm. and in your journey as a YouTuber now, mm -hmm. have you ever felt this sense of an imposter syndrome? Yeah, yeah. Um, and if so, man, how are you managing that? Yeah. Um, I can't say... If, if I'm being completely honest, like I did a, a video about this on my YouTube channel okay. and I actually expressed that this wasn't something that I struggled with in particular. However, it is, um, it is something that I understand mm -hmm. um, quite well. Um, Cause I'm, I'm, I'm understanding about imposter syndrome is that you're in, you're like embodying these feelings of not being good enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't say that I have felt that way. However, I do have fleeting thoughts okay. that what are you doing in this space? Like, yeah. is, this, is this where you should be? You can go to school for this, um, but it doesn't necessarily keep me down. Sure. Um, because of what you just said, right? Uh, um, that I'm growing. I know that um, where I am now is not going to be where I am in the future because I, I, I honestly just have a work ethic that says, hey, you messed up this time, but we're going to get it next time. Yes, like, sir. Uh, no, no, there's no doubt about it, right? And, uh, and it's not necessarily confidence in myself or anything like that. It just has more so to do um, with, hey, like I don't, uh, I'll take a failure for what it is, but I'm mm -hmm. going to learn something from this. I'm going to keep pushing. Okay. So from that perspective, I don't uh, deal with it within that way. Um, but I do recognize that I do have tendencies at times, these pockets of times where I'm like, wow, that person went to school for this. They're doing this, that, and that. They got these connections and whatnot. I got a theology degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did my master's in this thing as well. Like, yeah. What am I even doing here? Um, so, so yeah, I, I de there are definitely those moments um, but they haven't been crippling, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. So I don't, I don't even know if that's considered imposter syndrome or not. I don't necessarily consider it that, but maybe some people might. So I don't, it, it depends on how you, uh, see imposter syndrome, if that makes sense. It makes sense. And I think it, it leads us to this idea that whatever a working definition of imposter syndrome might be, I think there's a spectrum to it. And yeah, I think you know, yeah, where you find yourself, even if you don't even think you're on the spectrum, you yeah. mentioned fleeting thoughts, we can resonate with that, you know, yeah. that sometimes you don't for various reasons feel in any way less than or not good enough. At times, mm -hmm. it has to do with the fact that you don't come to the starting line with all yeah. of the preceding experiences. So maybe what I found out is sometimes a person can feel 
a significant amount of an imposter syndrome or, or various mm -hmm. iterations of it, when mm -hmm. they say, man, we have the same degrees, mm -hmm. we went to the same schools, mm -hmm. you know, we've had the same experiences, but yeah. it doesn't yeah. seem to be looking the same, right? Yeah. But often the opposite is just as true when it's like, hey, you know, I didn't get a degree in this. I didn't, I wasn't born with an inheritance with all this money. You know, I, I don't have mm -hmm. 35 mm -hmm. different camera bodies and 75 different lenses. <laughs> so, so yeah. I have no need to feel like an imposter. You know, this person's yeah. pictures reflect the resources they have. I don't yeah. have them right now. So sometimes that can, that can prevent a person from unduly comparing themselves to someone else. And then there are nuances in that. So what you said makes a whole lot of sense. And I think it's encouraging too to know that if I have a fleeting thought, it doesn't necessarily mean that I am suffering from this imposter syndrome. This, these words, this, this, this experience, I guess, you know, it's almost trending, right? That if mm -hmm. you're new, you know, somebody might say, well, be careful of the imposter syndrome. And I don't know if everyone who's newly arrived feels like that. You know, I think mm -hmm. babies mm -hmm. illustrate the most comfort at all. Like, I don't know any new baby who has come into the world and it's just <laughs> like, maybe I shouldn't cry. Because who am mm -hmm. I to cry? Like, yeah, You're I'm right. not the only baby born today. No, the baby says yeah. it's about me. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah now yeah. that illustration is loose because I'm not saying you should you should, <laughs> you should step on the scene and say it's all about me. I'm the new YouTuber Correct. on the block. I'm the new basketball Correct. player on the block. But Correct. my point is, new doesn't necessarily mean insecure. Right. Right. Um, I think that you've just illustrated that. Listen, I actually choose to operate under a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. you know, instead of a fixed mindset. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's interplay because at times the thoughts that come to mind at least give us a chance to say, what kind of mindset is at work in my, in my mind right now? Am I, am I allowing myself room to grow or am I permitting myself uh, to stay locked in? So mm -hmm. speaking of growth, do you, do you grow spontaneously or do you say I'm more of an intentional grower? In other words, I set benchmarks, I have goals, there are things I want to learn about photography and videography, and we'll pivot here soon to talk about some other things. Um, yeah. Or are you more kind of like, yo, I learned something new today by accident, and I now apply this to my life going forward? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's either or, it's more like both and. Yeah. Um, I, I do, I do... I do have a growth plan, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like I am intentional about, okay, I want to learn about this. Um, uh, in particular, an example would be is posing people for um, photo shoots, sure. right? Um, when I first picked up a camera and I got some people, begged them to come out <laughs> and um, take some pictures. Most times it was my wife or some really close friends. Sure. Um, uh, I... I, I, it's, it's almost as if I would fall apart because I didn't know how to tell them what I wanted and the way I wanted wow. them to do it. Yeah. So yeah. I have all the gear, but I don't have the one necessary tool in order to bring uh, them to life in front of the camera, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and that, that was a struggle for a little while. Um, and so it was, um, I think it was end of last year. I said, I want to get better at posing people. Mm. So I started watching a bunch of different YouTube videos on it and how people do it. Um, beginning of this year, I was like, you know what? I'm getting stuff from YouTube, but I want it to be a little bit even more specific. Um, so uh, I, I got an account with Skillshare. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I just been, I have been um, just binge watching a lot of these professional um, photographers that pose their models and their the subjects in, in, in a way I've never really even thought about. I've started mm -hmm. to learn the science behind some of it and why they do certain things. And that has allowed me to create poses um, uh, for myself, right? Because now I know the mechanism behind it or what a photographer is thinking when they're posing a model or and that has helped a lot but um just like a, a couple um uh, i think it was last sunday last sunday a couple of friends of mine i'll say hey guys come out um we'll go get some shots and they're youtubers as well 
And um, I had a, an entire plan of what was going to happen. And I got to the spot that I wanted to take pictures and it was all puddles. Wow. wow. <laughs> and, and I had to be a little bit more spontaneous. We had mm -hmm. to go over to the other side of the street and I just went with it. But because I had that foundation and I put in the time in learning how to pose models, when the spontaneous moment came up, yeah. yes, it was still spontaneity. However, I had a foundation that I could build on, sure. right? So, uh, and I think that's probably one of my better shoots I've had in a long time um, because I was pouring it, I was pouring into myself before I got to a place where I really needed to draw from the well, so to speak. So I think it's clear that doing photography and producing YouTube content does something for an audience. What does yeah, it yeah. do particularly for you? Yeah, um, it's an outlet. That's the reason why I started um, my YouTube channel. Um, I enjoy the creative nature of it. I appreciate, I appreciate the uh, editing portion of uh, YouTube videos as well. Um, it is something that I find a, a challenge that, um, you know, I, I want to figure out, can I outdo myself mm. uh, this time? <laughs> yes, um, yeah. And, you know, there's like a whole bin bunch of different programs where you can mark different channels as your competitors and um, see how you're doing in comparison to their channel and whatnot. I don't have anybody on those, those, uh, in those spaces. Because the only person that I'm competing against is myself. So within the last Ooh. within the last 28 days, it shows me 10 videos that I have made, and it ranks them. And my goal is always to have the number one video within those last 10 videos. If I'm mm. not two, I'm okay with that. However, I always want to be outdoing myself, and that's how I measure growth at this point. Yeah. So it's an outlet. I yeah. Love it. <laughs> yeah. But it's also a constructive outlet, right? I think yeah. at times uh, we can qualify outlets as those that do not have any additive value for ourselves, whether in terms of the mm -hmm. practice or the profession, or even mm -hmm. just in terms of our personal wholeness. Um, mm -hmm. And so I appreciate how you were able to say, even though it's an outlet, like it's not a mindless outlet. Um, exactly. It's not an outlet. I, I, it's not an outlet that only has a singular objective. That is to say, you know, there's nothing that can be measured in terms of growth. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, I also think that you can kind of play with it in, in, in this sense, that outlets that are constructive and helpful and measurable don't mean that I can't check out, you know, that I can't have my brain actually heal and refresh and restore while I'm actively using it with my subjects, while editing, while planning. And um, I think it just goes to sometimes the relativity of self-care and having outlets that some people might look in from the outside and say, that would be stressful. Like, that's not an outlet for me. Well, you know, that's okay. <laughs> it's not an outlet for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> like some people, you know, they go shopping, window shopping, and I, I don't know how you could do that because that would be just boring. And then mm -hmm. others, you know, washing dishes, going to get their nails done, you name it. And so I'm loving how this is one, not just something that has fallen into just the endless cycle of productivity, which I think is something mm -hmm. that this pandemic has caused us to really confront face on, mm -hmm. head on, mm -hmm. like, yo, we can really be about productivity and production and manufacturing um, and then distribution. But like, yeah. where is the reflection? Where are the moments where I say, wait a minute, do I ever unplug or am I just unplugging to plug back into something else? And mm -hmm. so this has become that for you, um, mm -hmm. but this is not all that you do. Exactly. You do photography, you mm -hmm. do videography, um, mm -hmm. and you are building a community. Mm -hmm. Before I go to this question, let me ask one more question and then we'll turn. Speaking of measuring growth, however, mm -hmm. YouTube, Instagram, other social media platforms can almost impose on you primary measures of growth likes, shares, subscribers, views. How do you negotiate those measures that are right there for you to say, okay, this is what I'm going to look through while also mm -hmm. having your own rubric of growth? Yeah, yeah. Um, if I can com 
be completely honest, I'm still wading through that. Yeah. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to uh, have a balance between what I deem as growth and what social media world <laughs> considers growth as well, right? Because <laughs> yeah. like you tell somebody you have a YouTube page uh, or YouTube channel <laughs> and they and like, oh yeah, what is it? 200, uh, you're yeah. not doing anything special, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or even when I just started and people are like, oh yeah, cool. How many subscribers do you have? Uh, 20? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's yeah. it's a little different, right? Um, so it's it's almost kind of like having blinders on like what horses have when they're in the races um, that you're not really looking to the left or to the right, but you kind of just keep pressing forward. Um, uh, a lot of people have uh, asked me recently, it's like, oh, how long have you had a YouTube channel? Oh, it's been a little while now, almost a year. Really? I didn't know. Yeah, I've been I've been here. I've, yeah. you know, I've been consistent. And um, I think that's my number one goal to mm -hmm. stay consistent. Um, regardless of how I feel, um, staying consistent. And then when I start looking at numbers, which everyone wants to, sure. to see and so on, while I am, um, while I try my best to grow, I am not bogged down with the numbers, yeah. right? So um, the last video I did may have, 200 views the next video it's a possibility that it might only get 40 to 50 mm -hmm. and that's okay um that also does tell me however what people are liking uh, me talking about yeah what people like to see me talk about i should say um and you know i do make uh, i do make certain adjustments uh, to to uh to you know help the audience stay <laughs> right. along with the videos right. um, at the same time i'm not selling my soul for the sake of views come on now um, come on now yeah so it, I'm, I'm not gonna get on there and do a prank or anything like that right. just so my views can spike right because then you end up killing your channel you do a prank yeah. it's like oh i really love this and a whole bunch of people subscribe and then you hit them with personal development photography oh we're not here for this <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so that's how i'm bound I'm, I'm i'm still waiting my way through it it's not a perfect system i'm not gonna lie to you there are days I'm like man i didn't even get one subscriber in the, uh, and i've done at least uh two three videos and yeah it hasn't happened um and then there are days where i'm like i did a really great job and i'm proud of myself regardless of if I got the views or the likes or uh, the shares or whatever it is. So it's an ebb and flow, to be honest. <laughs> and your transparency is definitely nourishing because uh, we're kind of walking in the same lane. And, I, and I'm and confident that many who are listening will be as well, not only in the social media space, but really that principle helps us in any area of life where there is mm -hmm. a growth objective, but also mm -hmm. because we are not living on islands we are people who live with people you know our eyes do look left and look right and this yeah. is also an opportunity to learn you know i remember recently i came in contact with you know you can do these new chapters on on youtube put it in your description and now a person can just go and say okay i want to look at this as opposed to trying to guess when will they talk about this yeah. you know if i wasn't kind of clicking through different youtube channels and and podcasts i wouldn't have seen that right but then there have been times where I'm saying, man, like, you know, how in the world does refrigerator organizing get 365,000 <laughs> subscribers and all these views? You know what I mean? And so you can begin to compare yourself to people who have different audiences, different interests. Mm -hmm. I'd heard mm -hmm. that there's space for anyone and everybody on YouTube. And if yeah. you forget that, I mean, you can do yourself an, a huge injustice and disservice by confusing yeah. and muddying your own goals with those mm -hmm. of other persons. And that can lead you to do things that aren't authentic. And people exactly. will know that, you know what I mean? Exactly. And so exactly. uh, <laughs> the example you gave was classic, like here I am <laughs> doing a prank. And the image that came to my mind was like the classic prank thumbnails, right? And then yes. get them onto your channel. And like you said, <laughs> the next video is something to do with personal development or five keys to Bible reading. And they're like, what? You yeah. know, like, yeah. I didn't yeah. come here for that. Um, exactly. And I'm, I'm experiencing that too, you know, just 
trying not to allow false filters or maybe not false filters, legitimate filters, but making mm -hmm. sure that I, my valuation of the effort is not, is not limited in terms of what it's informed by. Because there yeah. are days, man, and I don't know if you can relate to this. Um, I know for me, like, you just don't have the ideal motivating feelings to get up and do whatever it is, especially when a lion's share of it, man, Daniel, is behind the scenes. Yeah. For a 10 minute video that tells yeah. a compelling story <laughs> that gets people beyond the first 30 second intro and yep. has to go to the end, that, yep. that doesn't, you're not seeing you, you know, almost out the door, but then yep. maybe Aisha or Kyla says, hey babe, wait, one more thing. And you're like, oh, I was about to go. And yeah. then, you, know, you still go and the lighting isn't what you wanted to be setting yeah. up, taking down, you know, yeah. find out the end, like my most recent um, interview style, because I've actually gotten mm -hmm. into like solo style podcasting too. That's a different yeah. story for a different podcast. But <laughs> the last interview, man, the video quality on mine, I was using the same camera, the 50 nifty, nifty 50, um, same setup. And man, it was just subpar. And I'm looking mm -hmm. at myself throughout the entire video saying, this is going to be good. And in yeah. post, man, I was like, <laughs> what happened? And Kyla yeah. had to pump me off the ledge, like, baby, it's yeah. okay. Yeah. I can't call the guest and say, hey, you got another spare hour, you know, to do it all yeah. over. So yeah. my point is, man, those things can easily kill your motivation if you're yeah. just concerned only about the comments, the views. And also one other word, if you're just concerned about immediacy. Yes. Um, yes. Because I think you can often peer into another person's world based on those same measures and mm -hmm. kind of miscalculate how they're experiencing it. Um, there are mm -hmm. a couple of podcasters who, man, they have hundreds of thousands of subscribers. I mean, it's just like any video they put out goes very viral. And then exactly. when you're doing well, you're known, sometimes that creates access to other voices. So mm -hmm. like, man, I would love to interview President Barack Obama, but... Mm -hmm. I mean, I could send a message to his foundation. I don't know if they would be willing to give me the time of day. Then I <laughs> yeah. see him on someone else's podcast and I'm like, man, they got him because they have 2 yeah. million subscribers. And yeah. I could be completely missing the point to say, no, they actually have a relationship that goes back to high school, you know? Yeah. So, so I, I just love how you were able to help us say, I'm walking through it, but here are the ways that I'm seeking to negotiate them and I think a part of it is just meeting it one day at a time because there are days where everything that I've said is not true I mean it's mm -hmm. the perfect day you're motivated you're energetic and it's just like an athlete it was everything came together yeah, yeah. and just knowing that all of these are part of the journey yeah yeah, no, yeah, you're absolutely right, man. Um, like literally, I was just talking about this, that sometimes I'll take a picture, sometimes I'll get a shot, and I think it is, this is it. This is this is the one. I'm going viral. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and man, I get into I, I get into a Adobe Premiere or I'm getting into Lightroom, and I'm like, wow this is not it mm -hmm. and it is it is heart-wrenching and then there are days as well where everything does go well i do recognize though especially with social media there is a feeling that is attached to creating content mm -hmm. and if i do not feel good about doing anything or putting anything out there in the social media world mm -hmm. i'm not doing it yeah, uh, I, I used to. I used yeah. to do it. I was like, okay, for the sake of consistency, I am going to push through. However, it's not it's not consistent because it's quality drop off. Yes. And I'm not talking about perfection. I'm just talking about just knowing like within myself, I know like there are days I'm like, okay, I'm I'm gonna do something today. I turn on the camera, everything's ready, cool. And I'm sitting in front of the camera and I'm like, no, it's not it. I turn yeah. it off and I go hang yeah. with the family, <laughs> right? Um, and so I, I know as well that some days I do need to pump the brakes because I'm just not feeling. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, that And that has helped me be more in touch with my feelings as well, in yeah. a sense, because a lot of days I'll wake up and I'll feel off and the question I ask myself is like, what do I need today? What mm. do I need to get mm. me into the place where I can be emotionally available for my family? 
What do I need so I can um, uh, effectively um, study the word and really like bring something out of this text for the people of God on Sabbath? Yeah. Right? What do I need that is going to help me be of service to somebody else or to do a YouTube video, whatever it is. Um, so YouTube and just being on social media a little bit more actively now has actually taught me more about myself and has allowed me to become more in touch with myself because if I'm pouring so much out, there needs to be something that I'm pouring in as well. Ooh, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to me about pastoring, man. How has it been pastoring <laughs> on the front Pastor. lines um, as opposed to the classroom? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's different, obviously. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's nothing like I expected. Mm -hmm. And um, I, say, I say that, from the perspective of I'm 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 a pastor's kid, right? Grew up a pastor's kid. My dad started pastoring when I was probably around nine or ten. Um, so I have seen my fair share of good and bad days in pastoring. I've uh, seen days when my dad is excited, <laughs> just baptize somebody, they're on fire, they're involved. He loves that. Yeah. I've also seen the days where he comes back from that board meeting. <laughs> um, my man looks like he got beat up <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and I thought from that perspective and seeing some of the things that he went through that I was mentally prepared to mm. go through some of those days as well sure that is far from the truth <laughs> yeah. um, and um, yeah so it has been a lot of unlearning um, but it also has been a beautiful journey as well. Mm. Uh, mm. And uh, I, yeah, they, it just goes hand in hand. I've enjoyed um, working with the, the youth that God has allowed me to, um, uh, to, to work with, to be in their lives, to mentor in whatever shape, uh, way, shape or form I can. And um, this is my second district um, now. And um, my first district, uh, or my first church, I should say, um, it was great. It was great. I, they, they became like family. They were always over my house on Sunday. Um, I was pouring a lot out. I was doing children's church. I was doing a uh, youth group on Friday nights. And I, I was approaching the place of burnout because yeah. there was no space for Aisha and I to actually exist, right? And we were two ships passing in the night at some yeah. point because of this ministry that I have been called to. But um, eventually it was time for me to leave there. And I accepted a call out here doing uh, as a youth pastor and uh, solely no, no longer doing children's ministry. Mm -hmm. um, and when I came here, I told myself that you're going to do, do a few things different. Um, First of all, you want to be in people's life, but not too involved in people's life. Mm -hmm. um, I found that there was no line between ministry in my life mm. and ministry in other people's life. Yeah. So yes, it was cool that my youth were over my house every Sunday, but what was not cool is Sunday was probably the only time that my wife had before she had to go back to work yeah. and do it all over again, right? So we didn't get time together. She didn't get time for herself. And I said, okay, well, you can still be actively involved in people's life, but you can't be too involved. You can't overcommit. Mm. So I had to pull it back when I got here. Um, uh, I, when I'm with my youth, I'm with my youth, but when I'm with my family, I'm with my with family. My, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, love that. I love that. Those boundaries, we can, we can come into ministry with that in theory, uh, theoretical mm -hmm. understanding that boundaries are necessary and valuable, 
I mean, I have two copies of Cloud and Townsend's book Boundaries, right? And yet, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have um, I've definitely run into my fair share of boundary infringement, either in terms of you know wanting to be a an optimum uh, a pastor who performs at his optimum best, mm -hmm. or I have unknowingly allowed others to infringe upon family and personal boundaries. And either way, um, it just it, it's not healthy. Mm -hmm. And so like yourself, I'm an advocate for personal and professional wholeness as, as pastors, that would, that would mark our profession. And role mm -hmm. ambiguity, man, is like inherent with the territory. It um, is. On where you pastor, <laughs> you are, you come in with multiple hats, um, mm -hmm. expectations, some are voiced, some are, I, I, I dare say maybe more are not voiced uh, in mm -hmm. terms of what you're expected to do, who you're expected to be. Some of them are reasonable, but a great deal of them are unreasonable. And so negotiating them at the same time that we're becoming husbands, um, fathers, like it just can be a challenge. And we don't often have that class in undergrad or at seminary. Um, we get mechanics and yeah. praxis, uh, theory yeah. for theology, and all these things have their place foundationally, right? I, I don't mm -hmm. think we're saying we shouldn't, we shouldn't have taken New Testament interpretation or, or, <laughs> or Hebrew. No, we're not saying yeah. that. But yeah. those things don't come to your rescue you know, when now you're having to have the heart to hearts with your family, because they're like, you're here, but you're not here. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Um, yeah. So I love that you were able to kind of, again, the growth mindset. This yeah. is what it was in our first go around. Mm -hmm. But here's what it's going to be in the second go around. And mm -hmm. I think at every juncture, there's an opportunity to reflect on what was and say, how can we pivot? Um, by way of illustration, one of mine is, you know, I kind of had, I, I, I had this this, you know, don't want to miss two weekends in a row from church, right? Um, so if we travel, then let's be, let's be mindful of that. But here mm -hmm. is where it will kind of become a little bit up for critique, where mm -hmm. if we were traveling for ministry, then maybe that rule might have a little bit more flexibility. Well, this mm -hmm. is kind of a two weekend invitation. And so this is okay. But if it mm -hmm. were more like family, you know, my mm -hmm. family or my wife's family, then it seemed mm -hmm. like I was a little bit more insistent about, you know, just one weekend. And I had to do some heart searching and figure out if that was really rooted in a pastoral concern mm -hmm. or if in some sense it was disguising an insecurity. How will mm -hmm. I be perceived by the people if I'm away for two weekends in a row for family? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like, bro, you weren't really thinking like that when it was like a ministry assignment. So you mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Like those things mm -hmm. can be often subconscious have you ever yeah. in, encountered those those thoughts or something like that? Yeah, no, 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 no I ha definitely have. I'm, I'm just going to tell you though. Go ahead and take them vacations, man. Yes, sir. <laughs> take them vacations, man, because they they come in handy once that board meeting comes around or you yeah. start putting out too many fires, and you really cannot take that time off. Because I do believe that um, uh, what book was it? Uh, that I was reading. I can't remember at this point in time, but um, there's a book that I was reading. It was probably about two years ago now, and it talks about having a center, mm. and uh, um, your center is the place that you come back to recharge, to be rejuvenated, and so on, hmm. but there are stents where you have to uh, do a sprint, so to speak, sure. right? So, um, you're, you're letting your friends, you're letting your family know that, hey, for these next couple of weeks, I have some heavy hitters that are, that are uh, in my line of view at this point in time. And it's, um, I'm, I just need to take care of this. After these next two weeks, I'll be back. Um, I'll, be, uh, I'll be here a little bit more, but I just need you to give me two weeks just yeah. to take care of me. And those are some of the conversations that I've had with um, Aisha, um, and really a lot of this growth happened when I moved here. Uh, and I started to see that if I did not make intentional changes mm -hmm. to how I do ministry, that I wasn't going to have a healthy relationship to be centered in. Yes, if sir. that makes sense. Yes, sir. I, don't, I won't have anything to come back and be rejuvenated. <laughs> um, my, the house wouldn't be as peaceful mm -hmm. if I'm not putting time into yeah. my house right and into the relationships that are here and I really had to 
uh, do some self exploration, uh, exploration as well. Uh, because I actually kind of had the same rule, <laughs> like yeah. you did, uh, especially when I first started. Uh, every time we went to go visit Aisha's uh, parents, I was like, okay, cool. We'll go for like the week, but I want to be back. Like I want to leave Friday and be back in the pulpit. Yeah. Morning. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so like uh, that was, that was something that I put on myself. That was self-imposed. Yeah. Right. The, that wasn't a requirement that was definitely insecurity on my part. And I had to learn that when it's time for family, like I said before, it's time yeah. for family. I, uh, if I truly believe that my first church is my family, so to speak, right, then they need me, they need my time. And if that takes two weekends away from the church, okay yeah <laughs> that that is just fine um but all of that to say is most of the time i i don't have these long sprints anymore where it's bam 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 i'm always doing this i'm always doing that because you know i'm, I'm taking care of things at home but then there are shorter times these sprint times where i'm like okay this is happening at church this is happening to me with this person blah 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 like it, it's going to be a crazy couple of weeks. I need you to hold it down for me each, please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> While I go ahead and take care of this thing. I promise when I come back, I'm talking foot massages. I'm talking me going out to eat somewhere, like whatever it is, right? Like give her something to look forward to, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I know she's going to get me on the foot massages thing because I don't do them too often. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, but all that to say, like, it has been a growth process, man. Pastoring mm. is definitely, uh, uh, is, is definitely something that you have to be intentional with, or it can literally become your life. Yeah. And not to throw the older generation under the bus, but I am throwing them under the bus. They did make it their entire lives. They did. Yep. Yep. From early on, I find for many of them too, um, and, and I'll just interject with this brief illustration. Um, this was one of my first of two workers meetings. I can't recall if it was my first or my second. And workers meetings, for those um, are not for, who are not familiar with that language, you know, it's for pastors. You know, it's a biannual um, opportunity for all the pastors to come together, um, reflect on the past and look forward to the future in a nutshell, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, it's also a huge camaraderie opportunity because we pastor in separate um, parts of our region. So this is my first or second one. And one of the things that happens at both or one of the workers meetings, depending on how it falls any given year, is you welcome the new pastors. I think I was one of them, you know, we're glad to have Pastor Martin with us. You know, hey, welcome, new kid on the block, right? Um, you, you, you acknowledge those persons who have been in at different junctures, 5, 10, 15, 25, and then all the way up to retirement. Mm -hmm. So this particular workers meeting featured two pastors who are about to retire. That's one of the things I love about pastoring is, I mean, just the age spectrum is so vast that you get a chance to dialogue with people who've been doing this in this field since, you know, you were a, a toddler, <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes before exactly. you were born. So it's just like living history. So two mm -hmm. guys are about to uh, retire. And, you know, folk were clapping, Daniel, and, and the administrators, and again, like you, I'm not throwing them under the bus, but I am, <laughs> like, <laughs> make them, you know, a plaque and almost kind of like a pat on the back. Mm -hmm. And I literally, it hit me like a ton of bricks because I'm new. I'm just getting on this highway and you're saying, all right, you know, 35 years, here we come. And you're like, that's what's at the end of this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> now, and I don't know, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll be self-effacing. I'll put myself out there and say, maybe maybe that's the, the need for more humility in me. Maybe I need to get deeper into the word and be like, hey, you know, what'd you sign up for? You know, what yeah, do you yeah, want a yeah, house? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I yeah, yeah. think the optics of it was like, it put things in perspective in a way that wasn't necessarily like motivating. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so at the end of the day, if this is all you're going to walk away with is a plaque. Yeah. And you're going to sacrifice your family for that plaque. Yeah. And you can't get the years back. 
in addition yeah. to that, I mean, we can go into way, way more stories. Both of us have heard um, mm -hmm. of just, you know, almost irredeemable relationships with children and exactly. spouses and, and the ways that burnout and anxiety mm -hmm. and depression can lead to a lot of things. Um, mm -hmm. I just think for me, that kind of exposure allowed me to say, you've got to choose what you focus on, man. And yep. you've got to be mindful of how you define. And if that means editing some things, changing some expectations, then so do it. And, and, and to bring it full circle, man, there was one time where I just, the schedule, we just couldn't get around it. Like we, we ended up being away for two weekends. Man, dude, I came back and I had to ask myself, like, did these folk miss us while we were gone? You know, <laughs> like, one. Then number two, it was almost like they were saying, we're so glad you're refreshed. So all of that, you know, mental fog, like you said, was self-imposed. I had mm -hmm. these expectations that I wasn't mm -hmm. vocalizing to the church. And now I've become way more of an advocate and a defender of the peace mm -hmm. of my home. You know, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is my first sanctuary. So if it mm -hmm. means me having to say to, you know, a well-intentioned or maybe not so well-intentioned member who calls and says, pastor, I called, but you didn't pick up. Like, I know, you know, but here I am now. What do we need? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, exactly. to apologize, <laughs> you know, for those things. So, so man, what you're saying, man, it just speaks to my heart. And I'm glad that you two are, are learning kind of when things need to be in the fast lane. And yeah. then when, when it's time to slow down, because I think there's value in both. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. There is. <laughs> so um, we've heard the name Aisha several times here. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Aisha and I go back to the fall of 2005 is when we met uh, oh. at Pine Forge Academy and mm -hmm. uh, she's a year behind me and mm -hmm. um, I love Aisha's family her parents I mean just Jules you know that right so when did you know uh, mm -hmm. that she was the person that you wanted yeah. to to be permanently pictured <laughs> yeah. in your family frame yeah um, I would say it was right before I left Oakland. Okay. And the interesting thing about it is, um, before graduating, uh, we had only been together three months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We only had been together three months. Um, we were, you know, we knew of each other. Mm -hmm. We were in the same circles but we never really connected until like that last year. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember it was right before the Christmas break. I went back home to, um, uh, oh, actually, no, I went, um, my parents had just moved to Las Vegas uh, where my parents are, uh, yeah, where they are right now. My dad's passed from there. And um, I went there for the first time. And right before I left that day, I told Aisha, hey, keep in touch. And she mm. took that quite literally. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. You know, it's, just, it's just something that you say, right? You know? Right, right. But at, the, at that point, we weren't really seeing each other like that uh, just as yet. Um, but we, she kept in touch. Uh, we, we, um, and our friendship kind of grew from there. And I remember getting back on campus and seeing her maybe about two, three days um, after I got back on campus. And she was upset because, like, she's like, where you been at? Like, you've been on campus for, like, two, three days now. Like, what's, what's up? up? <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, our, our friendship started to uh, definitely grow after that. But actually, there was um, one particular moment that I'll never forget, and it's a strange one. I've told this story many times, so she's not going to be upset with me. It's out in the world at this point. Um, but I had just come back um, from a date with um, uh, a young lady. We had the same background. She's cool peoples, all of that. And, um, and you know, I, I just said to myself, like, she's cool, but she's just not spiritual mm -hmm. like that. Um, and I'm looking for somebody, especially in the space that I'm going to be living uh, as a pastor, I'm looking for somebody that can keep me grounded as well. Like wow. call me out when I'm, I'm, I'm going astray, right? Um, and Aisha called me the next morning after that date and she asked me to have devotion with her. Hmm. Uh, 
And it was at that moment in time, I was just like, oh, okay, all right. So I just, I was just talking to God about this last yeah. night. And then he's just going to answer my prayer in the morning, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was from that point in time, I was like, okay, I'm all in here. I'm, I'm seeing where this, where this goes. And um, right when we were about to graduate, yeah, I, I knew that, yeah, we were going the distance. Yes, sir. And, and at the, and when, even when I asked her to, uh, uh, she would like to be my girlfriend, all of that, I, um, the, the idea, and, and thinking about this now, I'm surprised she didn't run, because I said to her, listen, the way how I see things, the goal, end goal in this relationship is marriage. Mm-hmm. Whether or not, whether or not we get there, it depend, depends on the work that we put in this and if God gives us the, the year or nay. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's that's where my mindset was at. And she's like, I'm cool with that. <laughs> um, so so that from the very onset of our relationship, like we knew what the goal was, whether we reached there or not was still to be determined. But yeah, right three three months into the relationship going into the summer after we graduated i'm like yeah i'm gonna marry this girl yeah yeah for sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> how long has it been it's been five years yes, five sir. years uh, yes yeah. sir and, five great uh, years <laughs> five great years come on now All yeah, caps. Yeah, yes, yeah. Indeed. yeah yeah your family has expanded recently uh yes congratulations again again like we said at the beginning like you know our, our friends have kids and that's almost as close as we come to it. It's like, Oh, look at the picture. So yeah. <laughs> and, um, whew, what's life like as a mm-hmm. first time father? Yeah. Um, it is, I don't know how to explain it. You start really reflecting on who you are and what traits you will inevitably pass down to your children in particular my son what are things that i'm going to pass down to him Mm -hmm. Uh, what are things that i want to be intentional about teaching him when he's able to understand what are things that i struggle with that most likely he's going to struggle with as Mm -hmm. well um it it was very um yeah once once we decided that hey okay maybe we should start trying to have children blah 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 um I got into my head (laughs) a whole lot I was like what am I gonna teach this boy Mm -hmm. right um and uh and that's honestly where I've been it's when I don't have enough time with him during the day I'm like I need to I need to I need to spend more time with Ezekiel today right um, I've been I've been doing a whole lot of YouTube today. I've been uh, on the phone with members today. I've been doing this and that, but you know what? I gotta spend time with my main man, yeah. <laughs> right? And um, it, it's just it's different. I understand when parents say that when you have a child, it's like having your heart walking outside of your body. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's real. That's absolutely real. Um, he falls, he cries, all these things, and you just don't want him to experience that pain, but you know him experiencing that pain is helping him grow as well, Mercy. right? Um, so it has it has been uh, a time that has exposed some things in my own life, Yeah, but it's also been a joy, man. Whatever, whenever I hear him giggle, um, when he first started crawling, when he first started smiling, um, all of that stuff, all of those moments have been beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I, I would never trade them for anything else. And the only thing that I ever really want to do is capture even just a moment, whether that's uh, a picture, whether that's a video that I can ship away and we can look back on because like many parents have, um, have told us uh is that uh, <laughs> the that uh, what did they say they said um the time time is short but the years are long mm. wow yeah wow. yeah 
and it it, it seems like he was just born mm-hmm. just a couple of days ago and now he has a personality of uh, of his own mm-hmm. and you know he he'll let you know when he's upset even though he can't speak yet right um he let you he'll let you know what he wants even though he can't speak it he'll point to it he knows a little sign language he'll tell you when he wants more food <laughs> things like that right um so it's been it's been um something that ca- has caused me to be more self reflective um being a father but it has also uh been a joy yeah uh, i think the number one thing for me is it has actually taught me more time management as well because if i'm going to spend time with him and aisha then i need to have my ducks in a row yeah 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 mm-hmm. hmm um so we are black men hmm. <laughs> and over the past year in change yeah. uh, one of the narratives that we've had just no choice but to confront is you know, the safety of the black man and not to the dismissal of any black or brown body or anybody but um the black man has been put before us again as some would say a targeted um object so mm-hmm. now you're raising mm-hmm. son. man mm-hmm. What has your experience been like as a Black man from Canada, but who mm-hmm. also has spent time in the States? Are there mm-hmm. similarities and differences between the two locations? Um, and then finally, you know, how does that inform what you're doing with your son now? Yeah. Um, so just give a little context. I grew up in Montreal, Quebec. Mm-hmm. And in Quebec, while there is racism, um, more than anything else, what you see is the divide in language. Mm. There are people that solely speak English with a little bit of French or just speak English altogether. Mm. And then there are uh, people, Francophones, some of them most times are white. Um, and they don't want you to speak English in a French province. Mm. Um, okay. So you will get a pass if you're a black person that speaks French versus a black person that only speaks English. Wow. Right. And some would say that uh, 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 Quebecois, like they're called, uh, don't see skin color, but they do listen for language. (laughs) Teaching us, Daniel. You're teaching us. (laughs) So and I was just having this conversation with um, um a lady that's from there her family grew up there she's like yeah we don't see color but hey we're listening (laughs) wow okay okay and so i'm coming from that context and now i'm moving all the way down south to huntsville alabama where (laughs) i'm uh i'm seeing my first confederate flag and i'm like Mm -hmm. what is this flag Mm -hmm. right like because black history is not priority in quebec french history is knowing why we need to keep Quebec French is priority. So Black History Month comes around and we're only hearing about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, um, but that's about it, right? Mm-hmm. But, uh, <laughs> there's, there's no one else. Like, forget Malcolm X. <laughs> You're not, not hearing about him at all. So go, come, going to Oakwood was refreshing because I actually started to learn history that I wanted to learn. Yeah, uh, that I was interested in, um, you know, um, I've I've always heard of the Black Panthers being demonized, but it's at Ogle when I'm, when I start mixing with a couple of other people, I'm learning that well, yeah, they were radical, but there were also some, some, there are also some really great things that they did, like their breakfast program. It's like, Ooh. oh, wow, that's that's different, but then again. I also remember getting my license and being pulled over for a broken taillight, but there was no broken taillight. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, um, I also remember when I was in Michigan being pulled over about 11 o'clock at night coming back from Chicago after just preaching there. It's just Aisha and myself in the car being pulled over by a cop and he asked me if I had been drinking. 
uh, he said that he saw me swerving right across the highway. He said, no, I don't even touch the stuff. Um, I, I, re I remember these times passing cops, not speeding or anything. I'm, I'm not a speeder. That's just not my thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, re uh, I remember passing cops and I know, I know I'm going to see the, the, <laughs> the, the lights in my rearview mirror very soon. And behold, it happens. And they're coming to check to see if everything's okay. Right. Um, and that was only seven years that I spent in the States. Mm -hmm. And I experienced a lot of that. Um, so I've experienced that. Then I come back home to Canada. And I start noticing some things. While racism may not be as overt, it is a lot more... It's an undercurrent that if you're not watching for it, you'll completely miss it. Mm -hmm. I, and I start remembering things growing up. Why, unfortunately, the Asian man is following me around in the corner store. Yeah. Um, uh, I start noticing some things uh, like when I'm approaching a cash register and this white lady asked me, do I have anything in my pockets? Mm -hmm. You start recalling some things that have happened. And then I move out to Alberta here and I'm starting to see Confederate flags, Confederate flags, like in Alberta. Well, like I told you before, Alberta is the Texas of Canada. Right. So right. you're going to get sympathizers uh, that live way up here, but truly believe in this conservative uh, conservative agenda. Right. Uh, even here in Canada, there are some people that have had to block even members in particular because they've gotten too aggressive. They've asked me to stay in my place because it's not a place of a pastor to speak to social issues. Wow. Um, I have had. Um, um, uh, people that I look up to tell me that I am racist to white people um, because I speak out against the things that have happened in the States and things that have happened here in Canada as well. They believe mm -hmm. I'm too close to the situation, therefore I'm too sensitive. Um, and, and these are people, unfortunately, not just uh, these, these are people that are pastors as well, right? That have said things like this to me. So it's different. It may not be as overt, but I have experienced it both in the States and both here in Canada. Yeah. I've, I've experienced uh, someone yelling out a window to Aisha and myself as we're going to the gym, calling us niggers. Yeah. So it's just, yeah, sure, different country, but same problem. Yeah. And I, I believe that that's clarifying because at times our lens can be so focused on what is happening on United States soil that we can miss similar and then sometimes very substantively different experiences that still do warrant our attention. Uh, I have some friends in South Africa, and they have been educating me on gender-based violence. Mm. Now, that happens in the States, but it is it is a a headline in certain sections of South Africa. And I don't say mm -hmm. that in a pejorative way. I'm just saying in terms of as a student learning, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. often appealing for support and interest for what goes on here, I'm mm -hmm. having to learn the value of reciprocity, at least in beginning to listen so that I can learn. And so even though right. Canada is a lot closer to the States than say South Africa, I don't mm -hmm. want to assume that the issues here bleed over or that they don't. Right. Yeah. Who so has yeah. to say, oh, you, you wouldn't understand um, because, mm. you know, you're from here. But man, just in you sharing about what is the nature of what can be used to divide and what can create hierarchy in um, Montreal or Quebec, mm -hmm. listening, what? I would have mm -hmm. never thought that listening could translate <laughs> into, you know, yeah. because for us, it's always a C, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Kind yeah. of thing. You know, Martin Luther King, judged by the content of your character mm -hmm. and not the color of your skin. Well, mm -hmm. man, you know, I'm now thinking not only the 
content of your character instead of the color of your skin, but the content of your character instead of the way your your vowel sound. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so that that for me again demonstrates the value of listening as opposed to assuming, so that you can learn. Um, now, in terms of creating a new narrative and writing a new story, I think anytime we have children, that's an opportunity to say, I'm going to draw from my experience and give you my best shot so that as you live your life, you're able to yeah. learn from both my successes and failures as a man, as your yeah. father, but also yeah. from the community. Like, you know, I think most of our upbringing up until the point, you know, we're in our early 30s, we, mm -hmm. we, we are just now getting to the point where we're saying, no, future generations have a large body of work that is our lives to look at mm -hmm. it and say, you millennials as as revolutionary as you might have been in various ways you also mm -hmm. had some blind spots so i think both are going to be instrumental so in what yeah. ways are you and aisha you know trying to write a new story lay a solid foundation for your son yeah um as simple as it sounds we have gotten books that reflect what he looks like okay and and not even just storybooks, we're talking Bible stories as well. Yes. I mean, they're hard to find, but we found them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and something as simple as that we believe is a foundation to start with. And it's not to say that we're not read any books that don't have uh, any other ethnicities. Um, there's literally a book that's called... Um, um, babies of the world mm -hmm. where he gets to see what different colored children look like um um and sure we might have a few of the classics um uh, like beauty and the uh, beauty and the beast and so on and whatnot um but the majority of our books we want to make sure is reflecting yeah. what he sees yeah. uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and what he sees especially now in this pandemic is mom and dad they mm -hmm. look like him, mm -hmm. right um but besides that as well we have also realized that the reason uh why racism does persist as well is because a lot of families stay within their own circle and okay. people that look like them as well. So if I don't um, give Ezekiel a chance to mingle with a person from Scandinavia, and mingle wow. with some uh, person from Germany, mingle with some person from India or whatever, then his worldview becomes very limited. Hmm. And that's why I do appreciate Canada. Um, and, uh, and it's the one thing that I did notice about the States as well. There are a lot of sectors where more people do live in the same areas and they all look alike. Right. Canada, especially on the East Coast, um, where I'm from, it was a lot more mixed than that. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's history behind it, whether it was redlining or whatnot, that the states um, instituted with some of the, the, the things that have been done there in, in order to keep certain groups with uh, their people. Right. Um, but I did notice that in my upbringing, and it wasn't necessarily intentional, like where I grew up, there was um, a guy um, from Sierra Leone mm -hmm. that lived in front of me. The other people next to us, therefore, they were from, um, they're Scottish. And the people um, uh, right next to us, they were from Ireland or something mm. like that. And they all had different views of skin, but like it, it, I grew up with people that didn't necessarily look like me and it gave me a larger view of what the world is really comprised right. of. And, right. and I appreciated that. Um, however, I think especially within this time of social unrest, it might cause us to retreat into places that we feel more comfortable and because we're more comfortable, we will stop exploring and understanding other people. And my fear is if I do that, which I do feel like doing that, to be completely honest, I'd rather just stick with what I know, <laughs> um, then uh, I start to create biases about other people because I've never experienced them or their culture. Yeah. Um, so um, we, have, we have friends um, here in Alberta and not all of them are black and, and some of them have kids around Ezekiel's age. And we're intentionally having those conversations like, hey, we want to expose him 
to other people other mm. than just black folks, right? Sure. Um, we want him to know who he is, but we also want to know, want him to know who other people are too as well. Right, right. Yeah. I, I just want to commend that approach because I think that as difficult as it is, and it's amazing how, again, these conversation items kind of go full circle to things we've talked about before, mm-hmm. that whether you are developing a YouTube platform, honing a hobby, a skill, whether you are leaning into your profession, you know, you mentioned it earlier, things aren't always either or. We're often having to hold the tension of both and. Yes. And so I think that's the, the note that is that you hit so powerfully our son does need to know who he is in the context mm-hmm. of the community that is our home, um, as people of faith, how he uh, connects with God, um, mm-hmm. but then also that he is a part of a community that is a part of a global community, which is very diverse and varying on all mm-hmm. levels. And so you're right, biases can be created, um, limits, blinders can, can, can um, be caught if not taught based on how you all operate so from the intentionality for representation of what he sees what he reads um all the way to still recognizing that that has its place and thoughtful adult conversations with other parents to say we want our children to be able to be exposed in a healthy and safe way and then at Mm -hmm. proper times when they are exposed to things that don't reflect what we present to them to say okay now we can have conversations about this because Mm -hmm world is not a perfect place um everything's not idealistic and um i appreciate that speaking of the global community now um pandemic's done it's over we we all (laughs) breathe a a a sigh of relief you know we endured that which was the fires of this pandemic man and you uh, aisha and ezekiel can travel man for one year Mm -hmm. where, where are you all going yeah, um, I, I read that question out loud, um, and Aisha heard me, and she immediately said, Italy, we're going back to Italy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she's like, but we're not going alone this time. If, right. if money's not an issue, uh, if everybody has the, the time off and whatnot, we're, we're taking as many friends and family as we can, and we're just hanging out there. That is, that was a special place for us. It was the first time that both of us were able to get out of North America and see something outside of this, um, uh, our worlds, you know, (laughs) and um, we we enjoyed it. It was very different. We realized that North America is very fast paced and um, we do everything based on results. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in other places, they, kind of just chilling yeah. <laughs> they yeah. get to work when they get to work and I'm like this is strange uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Where I, like um but yeah we did enjoy um uh, visiting Italy we'd love to visit there again whether if whether or not maybe it'll be with friends maybe we'll be a family maybe we'll just be us ourselves mm-hmm. but we do want to get back there yeah Awesome, man. Listen, it's been a rich experience conversing, and I do hope in all sincerity that that does happen for you. (laughs) Uh, Kyla and I might just have to carry your suitcases to come along. (laughs) (laughs) Great place with great people and great food. Uh, I remember seeing a a number of the pictures that you all posted a few years back, and it just looked um, amazing. And so, um, man, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your time as well, man. <laughs> appreciate your time. This has been oh so valuable. I always tell my friends and family members that I, I end up being triply, triple and quadruply blessed because I get a chance to have the conversations. I hear it again in editing the conversations. I listen to it again once it's live. Then when people give feedback, so it's like all of these contours. And inevitably, um, there's something that you've said. And I'll be like, he said that? Like, whoa, like <laughs> that was deep. Um, so thank you for drawing from not only your family, but also your profession and also your outlets. They've created a wonderful network um, that I think really speaks to where we are um, in life. And friends, I, I know that you now have a broader and even a more pointed understanding of the terms exposure, focus, 
and editing. Yes, it has to do with the gizmos and gadgets that Daniel and perhaps you hold in your hands, but these things also have to do with the unseen world, the heart. Uh, there's a time where we ought to expose. And then there's some times where we ought to be mindful of what we expose. Sometimes we've got to focus in and lock in. And then there are times where we've got to say, you know what, stuff is not as clear, but I'm okay with that. And then we have to learn when, how, and where to edit. Um, putting some boundaries in place so that some things aren't seen in the frame. And then knowing where those boundaries begin and where those boundaries end. Um, Daniel, man, let the community know how they can connect with you. Um, where can they find you on social media? Is there a portfolio destination that you want to direct us to? Yeah, um, three places in particular that you can see my, my, um, my pictures, videos and whatnot. Um, first one is my photography page. It is optical.opium. Um, it's on Instagram. Uh, that is my baby. These are, this is the place where I <laughs> show off the things that I've been working on. Yes, sir. Uh, so if you want to connect with me there, that's uh, it's great. I always appreciate having new people there. Um, my personal page on Instagram is um, uh, dmad underscore 20. And um, that's just pretty much everything and anything <laughs> that has to do with family, YouTube, um, and whatever else I feel like posting. Um, yeah. My relationship with God, all of it. Yeah, that's that's where everything goes. Um, and then my YouTube channel, which is Daniel J. Madden. And um, yeah, that's, that's definitely uh, my heart and soul that I put out um, in the form of videography and photography. And you, you'll learn something about personal, uh, personal development as well, because those are some of the things that I am passionate about at this point in time. So yeah, those are the places you can connect with me. Awesome, awesome. Well, folks, thank you so much for spending time with us here in the living room. That's all we have for this episode. Until next time, continue to listen, continue to learn, continue to learn.